hint I heard is when you asked him if uh, the Warriors need another move. And the the punt came in the form of, like, my mind's not even on that right now. Right. I'm here at Team USA, and it's like, well, a Bolshevik. Um, like, well, I know. And then in, in the next answer, he's like, well, I've, I've met with Mike Dunleavy every four times. And, you know, and we talk we on talk the talk phone every day. day. What yeah. are you talking about, totally. Steve? You're talking about Cooper Flag? It's like Michael Thompson saying he and Clay don't talk about business. Well, all right. So um, that was one of my top observations. Yeah. And. It's not surprising by any stretch. We've certainly gone through it ad nauseum the last couple weeks, if not couple months, if not couple years. But I thought the tone that he struck with regard to Clay Thompson and and listen to it right here um, with what he says about what the last two years were like with Clay. Oh, I've been with Clay for 10 years, and uh, these last few years have not been easy. You know, coming off those two major injuries, uh, trying to battle back to become the player that he was, he's his own worst critic. You know, he's he's had a tough time. Um, I think everybody has seen that from afar, and he and I have shared, you know, so many conversations over the last couple of years just trying to help him through it. And I just think he's at a place now where he needed a change, um, just like People all over the world sometimes need a, a career change, a change of scenery. And uh, that's it's as simple as that. So as sad as it is to, to see Clay go, I completely understand where he's coming from. And, of course, wish him nothing but the best. I mean, what, what he did for me personally, but, of course, for the team, the organization, the Bay Area, um, that'll never, never be forgotten. When I hear the tone that he strikes there, It makes my mind go back to all of the other things that were said and understandably when they had to be said, you know, this is during the season or at exit interviews when Mike Dunleavy and others, we, boy, we want Clay back. We need Clay back. Steve Kerr with us last couple of weeks of the season. We, boy, we, we need more shooting, not less. We've got to have Clay Thompson back on this team. I hear a tone now within the organization of, yeah, we've known for a while that this guy's gone. This has been really kind of awful at times. And, and, and I don't even necessarily mean each of them feel that way personally. Um, I do think that Clay made things difficult at times on others around him because of his frustration with himself, but it was mostly targeted at himself. And so now you're hearing those on the inside kind of talk about how this wasn't just when he got benched in January or February. Like this dude has been a completely different guy, right? For the last couple of years, for two years, that meant, like even when they won a ring, it, like this guy was a different guy, and so the inevitability of it all to me feels very different now sitting here today. Yeah. And it's interesting because Steve Kerr talked about how he didn't hear the introductory press conference. And then Steve used the exact phrase that clay uttered change of scenery. And he said in his answer, sometimes you just need a change of scenery. And that's exactly what clay said in his introductory press conference with Dallas. And so the whole notion of change of scenery becomes, I think more of an accurate reflection on exactly where clay was and where the team was and so you know by the time he goes golfing with joe lacob down at riviera back in may it was a done deal and this thing had been two years in the making and when he didn't get his extension after the championship year he had two years left in his deal and the team could rightly say look you have two more years let's you know let's address this when we get closer to it and then The year happens where you beat Sacramento, you lose to the Lakers, and you give him an offer, and it's an offer that he's not happy with. And, well, he hasn't been happy for a long time. And at that point, you realize, okay, we see where this is going. You're making $42 million a year, and we both know you're not going to get that much. And so, you know, maybe it's time for you to go out into the market and have a change of scenery. Um, I tell you what, uh, there there was a lot more on this. Because, again, that that thing he said right at the beginning, the last two years, and and he put some, some emphasis on it now, is they're really tough. Yeah. So, so I, I asked him to expand on that and, and tell us what he could about the experience of the last two years. And, and here's what Steve said. The difference 
for me as as Clay's coach is, you know, from 2014 to 19 pre-injury, Clay was uh, unflappable. You know, he just he rarely uh, required much maintenance from me as a coach. He was just so happy playing and playing at a high level. And, you know, I would check in with him and he was always fine and loving life. And, and that changed after the two injuries. You know, he's, he's just uh, he's struggled to, to try to get himself back to that level. And even though I think he played really well at times for us over the last last few years and obviously helped us win a championship in, in 22 you look at the numbers you know even even though he this wasn't his best year you know he still averaged 18 points and shot i think 39 percent from three something like that so you know he's, he's still a really high level player it's just in his own mind and i think in the minds of everyone watching um you know he wasn't the same guy and as he was prior to the injuries and clay really struggled with that and i think the stuff that that went on organizationally, honestly, that I think that stuff is all sort of um, just a byproduct of the frustration with the injuries. And um, we were always, you know, in, in great stead with, with Clay in terms of our relationship and, you know, communicating how we felt about him. And, but, um, you know, he, in the end, really needed this career change, and I think it's going to be good for him. Okay. There's a lot in there. Yeah. You know, he said, hey, he still played well for us at, at times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the one that gets me is when he says, I think in Clay's mind and the minds of those watching, he wasn't the same guy, and Clay really struggled with that. So the obvious part is because everybody who's ever aged, and that's everyone, has the same experience when the mind will still do what it's always done and the body doesn't follow. That stinks. It especially, I would think, stinks when you're a professional athlete. Right. And and and, and it your is, body is your right? everything. It's your everything. It's your money. It's maker. your identity. It's your money maker. It's your ego. It's everything about you. But I read that as to say Clay not only struggled with that within himself, but he really hated it that other people viewed him as not the same guy that to me that was a huge sentence from steve kerr because that gives you a window into why this became something that like involved discord it involved argument it involved angst because clay couldn't deal with not only reality, but other people noticing reality. Teammates, coaches, executives, fans. assistant coaches, fans, Media everything. Media members. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, because Clay knows it. And, you know, to hear about it from fans and bloggers and Twitter and podcasts and all the rest of it and hear your teammates, like, have to have a meeting with you because you're shooting the ball too much. And, you know, that never would have happened before the injury. It's like, you know, Clay's going to Clay. Let him eat, you know, game six Clay, and Clay's going to go on a heater. And you never had to tell Clay before, maybe you should, you know, look to shoot a little bit less. <laughs> Tap it down. Yeah, yeah. And, but because he wasn't the same player, and you, now you have meetings with your head coach, and you've got conversations with everybody in the organization, it becomes more of a thing. Boy, that, that I found that all to be really interesting. I also, like, thought it was really interesting uh, to get him to react to what Steph Curry said with regard to, I want to be a lifetime warrior, but things change quickly in the NBA. Uh, if you missed the conversation, by the way, he said, well, I was standing right next to him when he made that comment and then essentially just blew it off. I like, it, Don't even think about that for another minute. And, and A, what else would he say? But B, I do think he's got a point. I get why we feel triggered by that. We would love for Steph to pull out a Sharpie and sign the Yahoo reporter's forehead. I'm going to be a warrior forever. But that's not reality. Why would he do that? Why would he pin himself in? I think he actually said exactly as a warrior fan what you would want him to say. I want to spend my life as a warrior. That, that, that continues into this moment, even though we don't have Paul George. And I don't really foresee that changing, but I'm not going to like lock it in i'm not going to lock it up as i sit here right now i don't know if i right is there an extension conversation is there a trade you know like down the road i don't know i think that if clay hadn't just left 
we wouldn't have been bothered by Steph's comment at all. I'll agree with that. Yeah. But the fact that Clay's gone, and that's why I was asking Steve about whether or not he had had a moment to really be reflective or circumspect over the fact that, well, Clay's gone, and now Steph and Draymond and Steve, at some point, you will be gone from this organization. And when the first one leaves, does it give you that that moment to think about it and reflect? And because he's locked in on the Olympics, no, he hasn't, but he will when he sees Clay in a Mavericks jersey and he gets to training camp and he realizes that Clay's not there, it's going to hit him in a certain way. But I think Steph just had that moment where, yeah, Clay's gone and now you realize, you know, I'm not going to be here forever. Whether I play somewhere else or not, there's going to be a time when I'm not a Golden State Warrior. And if you're Steph, you do kind of plant the seed of, look, I've only got two more years on my deal. And at the end of this next year, Honestly, you're going to want to extend me for however long I want to be here if things are still going well. So, and if not, you know, the door would be slightly open for him to leave. A couple other uh, headlines that I'm remembering just as I, I, I kind of go through the conversation we just had. Um, he definitely, to me, made it sound like Andrew Wiggins not being on Team Canada was a Warriors decision. Yeah. That was a Warriors decision, not a Wiggins decision. Well, he said it was mutual, but. You know, it sounds like if if it's mutual and Andrew wants to play, well, then it's not mutual. <laughs> and the team ultimately does have the ability to say, not, not that they can say yes or no, but it is a conversation that both sides have. I don't know I contractually. Wonder. Yeah, I don't know. The sense I've gotten from the people I've talked to is that it, it's, a, it's a mutual decision that both parties have to sign off on it. So if the player wants to do it, the team has to agree to it in order for the player to do it. Right, and the team doesn't have to agree to it. Correct. And if the team is currently on the phone with other teams trying to trade you, they're not going to do it. Probably. So they yeah. didn't. Yeah. That's kind of the way I heard it. Yeah. You know what and I mean? So if you're Andrew Wiggins and you really, really, really want to play for Canada and the team denies you the opportunity, then you might feel even more disgruntled about being a part of that organization. That's a risk you have to take if you're the Warriors. And then there's another headline, which was, Starting jobs are open. I mean, it's Steph not that, and Draymond and the rest of you, it's open. Well, and speaking of Steph and Draymond, I thought his answer was really interesting as well with regard to how many names you asked him about Kaminga. And he sort of was like, almost every name in the NBA is put into trade ideas every offseason. Every team might have one or two guys that are completely off the table, and he goes, Steph Curry is not involved in trade conversations right now. Yep. Everybody else might be. Huh. Yeah, in including Jonathan Kaminga. And that, or, you know, I, or Draymond Green. Green. Yeah. How, how about podcast about that? You like that? Curry just puts you on the block. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I mean, I'm kidding, but... Kidding, yeah. but, I mean... Steph Curry... Period. If somebody had called about Draymond Green, we'll take Draymond and a pick for Laurie Markkinen. Uh, you're probably doing that trade. <laughs> yes, you're gonna do. So you're gonna do that trade. Yeah, let's go to Ray in San Rafael. Ray, thanks for calling. You're on with Willard and Dibs. What you doing? Hey guys, um, I've been listening for a couple of days about and just for a while about this Clay Thompson thing. Been part of that conversation. I don't. I don't necessarily agree with this narrative that. Uh, that everybody was really upset with Clay and it was contentious as he was leaving. I think it's sort of a natural progression that anybody who's been at a place for a long time, especially as the, what Steve had mentioned, where, uh, you know, I didn't really have to worry about Clay. And then so Clay's exploring these new uh, feelings and conversations where he has to talk about his emotions and say, hey, something's not right. I don't know what it is. And I think they, I think that they all finally concluded that after he had, you know, got this opportunity with Dallas that they that they basically came to this conclusion that like that's the right move and everyone feels good about it and that's it's kind of like if you've been with a company for a long time you know it's time to go if you've been with in a relationship for a long time you know when it's time to go but once you once you're on the other side you're like all right that was the right decision so we got, I don't know if it was as contentious as you might think it might be well here's what I'll say Ray because um, we we do know a thing or two um, not all of it, about the way this sort of played out over the last year. And I, I don't think contentious is is quite the perfect word. I do think there were 
uh, mutual frustrations on certain days, but to, re- to, to report that the relationship was, quote, contentious, I'll agree that's not, that's not the perfect word. Um, but if, if what you're saying is, well, this just ran its course and it was just time to go because it's been a long time, I'm going to push back on that one too. That, that's not what happened here because Steph's been here even longer. Um, you know, Draymond Green, these people have, 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 and they have no interest in leaving. So it's not just, hey, it was a matter of time. It was Clay Thompson, as Steve, I think, very nicely put it, after the injuries, kind of became not just a different player, but a different person. And that sent the whole organization and relationship on a path and a journey that became very frustrating at times and then arrived at a spot where the Warriors were no longer prioritizing it. You know, I I, like if the Warriors really, really, here's how you can really answer this. And those of you who are like, well, Dallas, it was just the right thing. And it was time for a change of scenery. Well, then why did we go through all of the things that we went through? Why, why was Clay Thompson mad at an offer? Why was Clay Thompson trying to go to Riviera to get a new offer as recently as a month ago. Why were you trying to get all, why were you upset with the, uh, with the offers that are out there if you actually wanted to leave? So this, this did, this went both ways. And, and the organization got to a spot where they're like, you are not priority one. Yeah. And that only made him more upset. And I think that those conversations were happening long before you got to the end of the season and he went 0 for 10 in Sacramento. I think that that, that sense sure. was in for place sure. a long time before. And when you offered him 2 and 48 back in October and he said no to that, at that point you probably realized that he's going to want more than that and longer than that. And you didn't want to prioritize that as you went through the year and you realized that he struggled in October and in November and a little bit of December and the team struggled and you weren't going to be the kind of team you're used to being, you get to the end of the year and you got to get better. You got to figure out a way to get under the tax, under the second apron and get better. And so Clay's not a priority. And, you know, you get through another year, a second year of frustration. And I think that the relationship was just tense, not contentious. And like Steve said in the answer, you were used to this Clay being a no maintenance superstar, and all of a sudden now he's carrying this negativity and a little bit more of a burden on him that made it so you had to to check in with him more often than ever before. I mean, challenging situation, right? And this I, I think happens a lot, and maybe we don't open up enough space for it. But when someone has a huge individual challenge in front of them, how do you tuck that into a team concept? So. Clay Thompson's got to overcome two massive leg injuries, and he wants to try to play up to his contract and be the player he used to be and all of that. Well, how do you do that and and still keep the team goal, strength in numbers or, or strength in leg? Which did he want? And I think those two fought with one another inside his own brain sometimes. I'm not saying he wasn't a team player, but I do think that's what came out sometimes. Jordan Poole wants a contract. Clay Thompson wants health. Both of them want status. Both of them want a starting job. And at times, both of them kind of went off and started doing their own thing. And the team came down on them, and it led to a lot of stuff. And um, eventually, it led to both of them playing for different basketball teams. For different reasons. And, yes, you know, 100%. certainly you get to that spot where you got to do what's right for the organization. And it's hard when you're you're working with an individual who's going through something, and if that individual, while they're going through that, is becoming more of a drain on the team, you get to a point where you've got to realize that it's got to be about the team. And so that individual has to kind of get over their individual struggles in the in the better sense of what the team is trying to do. And, it, and I get the sense that Clay had a really hard time doing that over the last two years. All right, a lot more to hear from Steve